Let's talk about the purchase process. So, so far, we talked about finding a market, finding an area within the market. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume we've done that. Market done, area done. Now we're gonna find, hopefully, you have a team that you, you know, an agent or a team that you're gonna work with. By the way, I wanna say something about what I mean by a team. I'm gonna talk about that in a second. You know what, I'm gonna get around to it. So um, it's, uh, I'm gonna talk about it in a second. So next, what we wanna do is find, identify a property. Okay, so let's assume we found a property. We're gonna make an offer. An offer is a little bit an art and a, and a science. Every, every state is different. Every area is also within the same state. Could be different ways to make offers, let's say, between Houston and Dallas, for example. Why? I don't know. But that's just the way it is. And there's ways, acceptable ways, how to make offers, and it's not written anywhere. But when you work with a local agent, local here or local out there, it doesn't matter, that agent will know the rules of engagement. And it's important to follow that agent's lead in order to submit a quality offer. The reason is, if you submit an offer that is incom incomplete, what's gonna happen is that agent, the seller's agent, is gonna get that offer and look at it and say, this is incomplete, he's not gonna waste any more time on it and gonna toss it around. So that means if you don't follow, if sometimes they get the investor saying, why do they want that? I don't know. If it makes sense to you or if it's not too much trouble, supply it. If it doesn't make sense to you, don't, don't provide that information. But ask them why they want it, that's fine. But don't just hold back information that it's needed. I'm not saying give everything, okay? Every time when someone, some lender, some, someone asking for my tax returns, that's a big no-no for me. You have to really justify the reason why I would give anyone my tax returns. But other than that, you know, if they want a pre-qualification letter, they want to see some job information, some things that I'm completely okay with, I'm going to provide it with, with the offer because that is required or requirement. Okay, so I want to make sure I'm submitting a quality offer, not to waste anybody's time on a bad offer, you know, a bad way to submit an offer. Now, let's say we submitted an offer. One thing that can happen, it gets accepted. Easy, right? Most times, we're going to have some maybe negotiations, either on the price, blend, blend. sorry. Let's just make sure we're on the same page. An offer is not just the price. Price is the main factor. But when are you gonna close? Are you using financing or cash? Financing, what is your financing terms? Who's gonna pay for the closing costs? Who's gonna pay for the transfer fees? Who's gonna pay that? How much time do you want for, uh, for inspection? Do you, are you using appraiser? Is it a contingency? And so there's so many little factors that are you know, combined, they are part of the offer. The price is just one of them. When are you gonna close? 10 days, 45 days, right? So all of those things are being, you know, being uh, taken into consideration by the seller's agent in order to make the decision for the seller. Okay, so that, keep that in mind. Now, we submitted an offer, it gets accepted. Okay, good, we can move on. Many times we'll have some negotiation, like I said. Maybe modifying the terms, modifying the price, going back and forth, counter offer, and counter, counter offer, and counter, 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 counter offer, and so on. And eventually, you know, if we're doing multiple counter offers, that's probably a good thing, because that means we're probably gonna consolidate, assuming the, the gap is not too big. And we're gonna go back and forth a little bit. And then, most likely, we're gonna have an inspection, okay? I do not recommend you buy without an inspection, but it's, it's not a must. Um, it's uh, relatively cheap, and you're buying normally, uh, you know, an expensive property, even if it's not the million dollar or the hundred thousand, or even you're buying for twenty or thirty. An inspection is relatively cheap, and what happens many times with inspection, things come up in the inspection, and you're going to use that as a leverage to renegotiate. So we may come back from the inspection with the items and say, guess what? Reduce the price, fix this. Reduce the price, fix that. Okay, whatever happens. We may run into a seller who says, take it or leave it. I have an offer uh, being put tomorrow. I already, the seller already told me, no inspection. That's been going for a week. And then I managed to smooth talking a little bit and then said, okay, then I said, okay, I'm willing to do an inspection, finally, thank God. I even offered, you know, it's one of my investors, we offered to pay 
you know, uh, for, the, uh, for the tenant, for her trouble, to pay $300 so we don't trouble her, because that was his excuse. And then he said, okay, you know what, fine, I'll do inspection. But he said very clearly, you can do an inspection, but if something comes back, I don't fix anything. The house is perfect. Mm -hmm. But I want to make sure for my investor, my investor will say, oh, you know what, let's not do an inspection. I said, no, it's your decision, but my advice is not to do, is to do holding inspection. I want to find them, I want to make sure there are no major things. Maybe the seller doesn't know there are major things in the property because he bought it two years ago, fixed it up, and didn't really care. So I want to make sure there are no major things in the property so my investor is not, you know, two years later, say, what have I done? I saved myself $300. And guess what? If I'm running into a situation like this, okay, I already told my investor, let's move on to the next one. He actually insisted to buy it and said, let's try again. But I said, let's move to the next property. We don't have to fight over it if he doesn't want to do an inspection. It's your decision. I always suggest you do that. Uh, if, you're using an, uh, if you're going to use a mortgage, there's going to be an appraisal done by the mortgage company. By the way, you pay for inspection. If you buy or don't buy the property, you pay for, for appraisal. If you buy or don't buy the property, just keep that in mind. And if you use a lender, the lender will send a pre an appraiser. So it's a must. It's not even a, you know, something you can choose. If you're buying cash, it's entirely up to you as well. And let's say the inspection is over. Normally, it's called a contingency. We have an inspection contingency, an appraisal contingency. Once everything is done, it's called removal of contingencies. And then we can move on with the process. Many times, when we move, in most cases, when we remove those contingencies and maybe other contingencies, then that means the money, the deposit, we're going to put, actually, we already put in the acceptance is, you know, will be forfeited if we change our mind. Just keep that in mind. So if you're not serious about buying, don't even get started with the entire process. Or keep in mind, if you, put, if you pay for an inspection, an appraisal, and you put a deposit, let's say $2,000, $3,000 deposit. So that means so far out of pocket, you're about $3,000, maybe $2,500. And then you get cold feet, you lose that. You're not going to get it back. Just keep that in mind. Um, next, we're going to have open an escrow account. An escrow account means a third party vendor, normally licensed by the state, to handle transactions like this one. The escrow will, will make sure where you know it takes care, it, it takes the agreement and makes sure he identifies the property, the, the, all the parties involved, and that you know, and he will actually be accepting funds from all resources, such as your down payment, the lender's funds, and then will distribute those funds to at closing to the seller, to maybe the, the other mortgage company, maybe uh, agents that are involved, and, and so on and so forth, everyone that is uh, related to uh, to the process. So that is what the escrow company will do, an escrow account, a title company that it's normally either within the escrow company or just sitting with the escrow company will do what's called title search. Title search is someone who's going and searching that the title is clean, meaning if there is a problem with the title, such as let's say a tax lien, or maybe an HOA lien, a water lien, IRS lien, stuff like that, it's going to show on the title. So the title company researches that to make sure you're buying a clean title. The only thing that should be on the title is a current mortgage, which will be cleared once we have we are paying them off, and we're going to have another mortgage com company putting a, a, you know a title you know um, putting a lien on it, so it will show the new one. And then most title companies, what they do is they give you title insurance. Title insurance means that when you're buying the property clean from every, any problems. Uh, if they miss anything, they will take care of clearing that, you know, whatever lien they missed. So that's the title insurance for. So we have an like escrow company, the title company, you know, all kind of putting things together for you. We're gonna have a closing date, a settlement date. In that day, we're gonna have to wire the funds. When you wire the funds, you're gonna do, you need to do it through, you know, a transfer wire or cashier's checks, no personal checks at that point, but, you can use personal checks when you're making the deposit right here. We're going to have the closing date. That means all the funds are coming in from everybody and all the funds are going on to the relevant parties. The title company will normally record the property. That means go to the county, not physically nowadays. It's mostly done electronically, but recording it. Then now you are the proud owner, of course, of this property. 
So that means public records, and that's what the company, uh, you know, uh, recording uh, the tire company will do. Next, you will probably need to do sign an agreement with the property management if that's what your uh, your plan is, or with the rehab team if that's what your plan is, and then put the property as a rental or for the renovations. So that is the entire process, step by step. Um, it takes a little, you know, there's a little more nuances from one state to another, and when we're buying um, a short sale versus an REO, homeowner, etc., etc. But in general, that pretty much uh, specifies that. Any questions on that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, of all of these steps, which one do you pay most attention? Let me move back. Which one what? Which one do you pay most attention? Like there are so many of them, but there must be one or two key points that you need. Um, to that's a good question. I would say uh, the offer is probably the most uh, the one that you want to pay attention to because that's actually the offer becomes the contract. Now, what I love about, you know, going back to one of the beginning, I said this is a sophisticated real estate market, the U.S. One of the things I like about it is that the following. So you make an offer with an agent. Agent is a licensed person, okay, licensed by the state. So that means it's, he's regulated, he's, you know, scrutinized by the, state, the, uh, the board of real estate or whatever. So that is a good thing. Inspector, licensed people. Appraisal, licensed people. Escrow, licensed, bonded by the state. Title, the same. So look at this, everybody here, in property management, most states require they carry a license or a certification, it don't, not always the case, but almost everybody in this process is licensed, is scrutinized, is subjected to laws, subjected to so many regulations, so they can't, you know, and there is a lot of transparency for that. That's one other thing I like about it, a lot of transparency. But everything here, so, okay, I should say, the offer is, is something you want to pay attention to, and then the inspection, of course. So that, that's a report you have to read, uh, not always that clear, but almost every inspector I called after they conducted an inspection, they, called, they were always very helpful. They always say, call me, I have, you know, if you have any questions, so there's no problem to pick up the phone and call those guys and say, what did you mean here, and what did you mean there, and what did you see? And we done a, you know, we done an investigation to one of the inspectors about a month ago, and I think, did you crawl under the house? He says, yes, I did. Did you crawl into the attic? He says, yes, I did. What did you see? You know, so he was very helpful. Because those things he wouldn't put in the report. But he says, I was at the attic. But did you really go into? Or did you, did you pick? So those things that kind of we wanted to see. Um, so those are probably the main two areas I would put attention to. OK? Any other questions? Yes, we're going to have more time for questions. but so, but. For now, yes, go ahead. Can you speak a little bit louder? Do you have tips for us on how to make an offer in a house? Especially if you have multiple offers, you know, how do you... I how let the say? agent, first of all, I let the agent handle all of that. They just tell you the highest price. No. So. They, let's say the market price is like, you know, 500000 right? Mm -hmm. So in order for you to get that property, you just say you just offer 10% more, then you are sure you will get it. Then I don't need that. So you're asking <laughs> what offer should I put on the property? How do you know what to put on the property? Right. The, the best answer I can give you is I work with my agents. Okay. And I have to tell you, I even have to train my agents sometimes how to do it a little bit better because they want to please the investor is my investor, but at the same time, they want to do a good job. Some investors get a little bit more confident and say, if, you, if they offer, you know, we have to know what's going on in the marketplace. So one of my agents used to be very kind of, you know, to the point. He would come to him and say, here's a property for 68. He would say, okay, I want to make an offer for 62. He would say, no go. And you say, I insist. He said, you insist, go elsewhere. Because I'm not going to waste your time and my time. And you what's going on in the market. So he was right on. Um, but he would find, he would find, you know, he looks about, he looks, they look what's going on in the marketplace. They know what's going on in the area. That's what they should be doing. Um, and that's, I listen to those guys. I work with them. One of my agents, you know, he's a little bit softer and he's actually kind of want to please you a little bit more. And I'm trying to toughen him up a little bit because he's wasting time. No, it's not, I don't care about wasting time. I care, you know, if you make another offer and if, you know, in another offer, they all don't work well. You wasted a lot of time, and guess what? Energy. And that's a good point, because when you make offers, some markets, be ready. You're going to make one, and then they come back to you, they don't. Sometimes they, they come back and they ask you to make a better offer. Sometimes they, you know, the sellers, 
agent, they don't come, you don't know if they accepted it, they've seen it, it's like a little bit of a black hole where those guys are not always responsive. Sometimes they're coming back and say, okay, give me a better offer, and then you go back and forth, that's good. Uh, many times, we don't know, we just don't know. Now, think about everything we've done. So we found the property, then we've done research on the area, that's, let's say, done. We've done research on the property, we make a decision, we put some hours into it, we make an offer, no answer. We make an offer, no answer. That means our offer wasn't high enough or good enough. That creates frustration. I work with the agents and sometimes I ask myself, you know, should I make a little bit better offer? Or maybe I need to build my confidence as an investor, saying the first offer is, was going to be a little bit more aggressive. I'm going to make 65 on a 68. And they, even if the realtor says it's not going to work, you know what? I'm, I always tell my, you know, my investors, you may lose one or two in the, in the process, but you built you build your confidence in making the offer. And the next one, say, you know what? Let's make it in 68, let's make it to 69, or, or even a 70, or, or whatever the numbers are. So it, you have to work with those guys, and you have, or, you know, have to see what they tell you about what's going on in the marketplace. And then you may have to kind of waste a little bit of your energy until you get to the point, say, okay, I get a little bit more confidence, what is the right offer that I need to put? It's a little bit art and science, okay? And remember, it's not just the price, but it's the main component, but it's not the only one. Yes? So how do you, how do you go about picking a property management company? Like, how do you, how do you find them? So how do you evaluate them? Okay, so let's talk about, uh, thank you, let's uh, move to the next slide. Okay, so your team that you would need is, you need, in my mind, an expert advisor, someone like me, doesn't have to be me, of course I want you to be me. All of you, you must work with me, but if not me, someone else, but I do suggest you have that figure. Someone who's more knowledgeable in the fine nuances and details that he will help you, guide you through the process. Um, but then, that's one. Then an agent, a good agent, I suggest, that you can trust, especially if you're working out of state. And then a property management company. Now, how do you find those people? I do due diligence, I get references, I check their uh, records online. Uh, sometimes before even speaking to them, I go online, I just see if they're clean records. Sometimes, uh, if I can, I go even to the court records and I check and see if they have anything. So I do a very thorough uh, due diligence before even speaking to them. Sometimes by the time I pick up the phone, I already know that what their, their standing is. <coughs> um, it's not that easy. It's a lot of time, a lot of uh, energy, and uh, a lot of, you know, sometimes I have to go through 10 or even 20 agents until I say, okay, this one looks fine, and then I talk to them. And then I get both, and then I get references. You now, when I interview and a reference that the, that person gave me, it's not an interview. It's an investigation. I go through questions, I drill them. Because, you, you know, if you're, you know, when you do a reference, you'll send me someone that you can trust that will, uh, you know, that will, uh, you know, that uh, the service provider knows what this person is gonna, you know, is gonna ask, is gonna tell me, right? But I want to drill them. They're always, you know, surprised. I'm, I'm completely taking, the, you know, taking them by surprise, saying, "Oh, I've never have asked, you know, nobody ever asked me those questions." And, oh, this is, this is good. You know, you ask a very good question. I always get that. So I go through a lot of questions, a lot of drilling, I'm trying to poke holes, poke holes, that's the way I do it. And only when I'm done myself, and I've you know, been through, then there's the leap of faith. Everything checks, I, you know, I set up a relationship with them, and truly, it will, it will take time until, uh, you know, until I will build that relationship. It will take a long time, multiple deals until I get, we all feel comfortable. And I always, I've been doing it for so long, I already know the milestones, I know, a month, a month and a half after starting working together, we're gonna hit a, you know, a, you know, we're gonna get a bump on the road. We're gonna argue a little bit. And the way we're gonna come out of this argument, that will determine the rest of the relationship. I already know that. Been doing it, I know. With over 50 property management teams over the years and with over probably 50 agents over the years. Okay? Uh, but you can do the same. Uh, it takes time. It takes experience. Um, and by the way, when it comes to real estate, when you analyze so many properties, there's going to be a point in time, remember this, if you've never invested or you're sitting on the sideline and you're not sure, there's going to be a time when you see a property and you need to do what? Take action. Take action. Pull the trigger. <laughs> you're going to have to pull the trigger eventually. 
right? So it's going to happen now. Is this going to be the, per the perfect property? Maybe. I don't know. But we're always going to have this buyer remorse. Always. I've, I always have this to this day. Okay? Always. Just, just be, remember that. There's going to be a point in time you're going to ask yourself, you know, we're all trying to find the best property. Now let me tell you what is, you know, what is best about this, even if you don't make the best decision. So if I buy a property, and let's say with a mortgage. Now, let's say we have a little bit of a positive cash flow. You know what? Break even. For the, I hold it for 15 years. I buy it with a mortgage. Nothing, you know, nothing too, I didn't even, I barely analyzed the deal. I just know that it's an okay area. Okay area, not even good area. And I bought it with a mortgage, I hold it for 15 years. Okay, or 20. Zero cash flow, breaking even. Good deal or bad deal? Good deal. Why is it a good deal? It didn't cost you anything. Hmm? It didn't cost you anything. And you learned? Well, I did put my down payment. So it did cost me some. So why is it still a good deal? You learned. Learn? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a freak of free learning. Appreciation. Appreciation? Zero appreciation. Good deal or bad deal? Good deal. Why? Hmm? Tax benefit. Let's say I can't even use the tax benefits. I mean, can only make it harder. Good deal or bad deal? Somebody paid your mortgage. Say again. Somebody paid your mortgage. Somebody paid the mortgage. So zero appreciation, no tax benefits for that sake, zero cash flow. What happens after? And let's assume I didn't have to put repair anything. You know, I'll make a little bit of a lean way for me. Let's say I didn't repair anything over time. So I hold it for 15 years. It was rented, had some vacancies, on average breaking even cash flow. 15 years later, I sell it. Or let's say I paid it off in 15 years or 20, whatever. What happens? I get, you know, let's say I bought $100,000, I put $20,000 in, and I sell it for $100,000. It only cost me 20, and I got 100. Can I do better? Of course. But how is this, how's this as a starting point? Good deal or bad deal? It's an okay deal. I can live with that easily because I used only $20,000 of my money and I got, at the end of the road, I got a $100,000 property. It's, a, you know, it's an okay deal, it's a good deal. Of course we want to do better than that. We all want to find the best property. It doesn't exist. Every property in my book is a good property as long as you don't do adventurous stuff. You don't go in the middle of nowhere, you don't buy weird car properties or bad areas, but if you buy okay areas, okay properties, it, you know, it will be okay. Relax, kick back, it will be okay. It's just the way it is, you know. I have the confidence of 10 years to stand here and say it. I don't have the confidence of theoretically speaking about it. I've been experiencing it myself on my level, on my investor's level. So just remember that. So when you get to that point of pulling the trigger, pull it. Pull it. Seriously. Don't just, you know, analysis paralysis and, you know, and yes, no, yes. Pull the goddamn trigger. You know, it's funny, but it's true. It's hard, but it's true. Okay? Then, secondary team. I'm going to need an insurance agent, maybe a rehab team, an attorney, tax advisor. We all know that. Uh, so those are the other things uh, that, uh, that you want. For me, when I go to a market, say, let's say, when I say I have a team in Dallas, or team in Atlanta or Orlando. For me, teams, it's not the solution. For me, I need a system. I need, when I send an investor over, they know how to handle, I know and they know how to handle the entire system, which is as smooth as possible for the investor to complete the transaction. So for me, it's not an agent or a property manager. It has to be a system. Combined, those are main, two main components, and I'm kind of the quarterback of, and many times I find those teams and I teach them how to do better. I help them to become better performers, both professionally and locally, with the amount of work they get. Um, okay, a couple of things I want to talk about to be aware, to or from, and some of you may have heard it before, land. Certain type of land, let me say. So I've invested in, and again, I can be wrong, everything, you know, some of the things I say, they're very objective. That's the way they are. The, the purchase process, give or take, that's pretty much similar in every market. You know, of, of course, there will be nuances. Analyzing, you know, some people have a different way how to analyze, you know, to, you know, deals. That's fine. Some things that I'm saying, like now, it's very subjective. 
And I want to share this experience with you. I bought many pieces of land over the years. Not too many, but not, you know, but quite a few. And I can always say that they were terrible. Okay, and let me tell you why they were terrible and how I refine my, uh, my decision when it comes to buying land. Many times land opportunities are coming in some sort of a bank, you know, land banking or something of that sort. I'm not killing the deal here, just opening your eyes to be aware. Eyes wide open, that's what I'm uh, trying to accomplish here. Many times there, there's a huge plot of land outside of the city, you know, maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes an hour, and it's a huge community, they're building it, they're dividing it to lots, and now they're selling lots to investors. And they have 200 lots in the first phase and 300 lots in the, you know, the second phase and so on. It's a big developer, huge guy, doing a lot of, you know, they're putting the clubhouse and they're putting this and they're putting that and roads and the gate and oh, it's beautiful. And you go there and it's gorgeous, right? Gorgeous, beautiful, right? So that's what happens in those type. If you see something like this, this is for me the be aware one. Because here's what happens. They're selling many pieces of land to investors. And what happens is they're saying it's going to appreciate because we're developing the area. It may, may not, who knows? First problem, you buy a piece of land and you can't really rent it unless there is a demand for tents in that area. <laughs> so you can't rent it. So it sits there, which is fine. But remember, there is homeowners association and taxes. So that means there's a negative cash flow, which is fine too if you calculate it, you know, factor it in, you know, when you got started. Then, fuel is gone by and it's really appreciated. How nice, let's sell it. Now you and your 150 neighbors, investors, all wanna sell it. So you're competing with everybody. But remember, I just said 150 in first phase when we have 200. <laughs> Who owns the other 50? Who? The builder, the developer, exactly. So when a buyer's drive, when a buyer drives into the community and steps you know, to your lot or goes to the sales office, and there's a developer representative sitting there, and he owns the developer, remember, 150 sold to investors, 50 are owned by the developer. Salesperson, you come up to him, I'm the buyer now. Whose lot is he going to show you first? What? Take a guess. He is, of course. So now you're competing with him. He's a nice guy, but you're still competing with him as nice as he is. So that's for me a first concern. Okay? So I don't like those big you know, uh, developments. Second, a lot of those developments, they require some speciality in order to be able to sell it. So your typical realtor agent is not really familiar with selling lots or selling lots in that area, assuming he would have access to that area from the developer. So right there, there's a problem here. So the next thing I wanna make sure is how many realtors I can find just blindly. Forget about analyzing them, just so I can know, can I find one, two, five realtors, at least five realtors that are able to, to help me sell those pieces of land you know, in the future. If I can't find five, that's not good, not in my book, and I'll tell you why. If you have five, one you don't get along with, one doesn't answer your phone calls, and one just doesn't work for him, then you end up with two. They're okay, but look at this, whoop, two. You start at the five, so if you find one, and you guys don't get along, guess what happens? You end up with zero. For me, that doesn't, you know, doesn't fly. I don't, you know, don't like that. So remember, when you buy pieces of land, like this, in this type of a situation or scenario, my suggestion, be aware. I don't say go out where with Mountain View, go to the you know, next street, there's one lot available for $250,000 if we're lucky or whatever, and you know you have a plan what to do with it, you know what to, to buy, build it, that's fine. I'm not saying no to land, I'm just saying those big lots of multiple you know, parcels, and then you compete with multiple investors, and, Unless you have an, another agenda that you can say, you know what, I'm going to buy, I'm going to build on it, and then everybody else is not building, and I'm the only one who's building, or a few others are building, maybe that makes sense. But just be aware of that. That's for me something that I've learned, you know, the hard way. Lost money and, heard, and learned the, the hard way. Uh, you know, whatever you want to do with it is entirely up to you. Small markets, moving on. 
What is a small market? Let me give you an example. Everybody, anybody heard about Cape Coral, Florida, or Fort Myers, Florida? Okay, Southwest Florida, two hours west on the, on the Gulf of Mexico. It got a lot of hype during the 2004-05 uh, boom, a lot of hype, uh, a lot of lots as well, not in that scenario, but a similar scenario. And then um, it, it's starting to get a lot of hype again. I'm just using it as an example. I'm not saying bad, good or bad. I'm just using that. It's about the 500,000 population metro. You already know that's not, in, you know, in my book, a good area to go to. Not a lot of, you know, not many employers. Or if you go to a small, area, not necessarily there. You know, one employer, one bigger employer moves the plan from one city to, to now he moves it to Arkansas. Guess what happened to employment in the area? I don't like that. If you go to this university town, and you know, even the university can go through you know, tough times, and they let people go, the area suffers. If you go to an area that has two major employers, one you know, goes belly up, what happens? The entire area you know, gets devastated. That's for me why small markets just don't make it. Why would I want to go to a small market when I have so many good alternatives, right? Who cares? Um, decreasing population areas, we know some areas in the country. By the way, there is a migration for the past 10 years plus of from the northeast, not all the states, but in general, the Midwest and the northeast, some of the states, not all the northeast states, some of us are shrinking, and the south and the west are increasing. So there's a migration of population uh, from those states down south for jobs, for weather, for tax, you know, benefits to some of those states are giving and so on. Okay? Follow the trends. You want to find the trends? Go to my website. Atlas sends me, you know Atlas Van Lines? Anybody? Everybody knows Atlas, the biggest, I think, company, you know, moving company in the U.S. They, you know, they send me every year the report. They say, put it on your website. Here is what happened in 2010, 2011, and you see the migration. They count how many trucks they took from one state to another and how many trucks, you know, how many trucks drove out and how many trucks drove in. And it says this is the true migration. So that's something you have to follow and see. The south and the west are increasing and the northeast and the midwest are shrinking. Okay? Some of it has to do with the baby boomers. Okay? That some of them do not want to probably continue shovel snow in their 60s and 70s <laughs> and maybe enjoy, enjoy, uh, you know, uh, playing golf. You know, you know, seven days a week or so. Um, and then one last thing, I just want you to be aware, there's something called the Chinese drywall. I don't know if anybody heard about that, but there is a situation, I should say, in Southwest Florida, where in, during the boom years, they brought a lot of drywall from, from China, that's why it's called Chinese drywall, and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's polluting some uh, some bad uh, uh, um, chemicals or something like this, and the problem is a double whammy. One, it creates a liability for us as the owners, okay? So that's why it's a problem. Two, if you want to replace it, it's going to cost us on a eighty, ninety, a hundred thousand dollar home, we're going to be anywhere from thirty to forty thousand dollar replacing, the, you know, uh, the drywalls. Okay, maybe twenty-five, right? So that's not, uh, not a cheap price to pay. So there is, you can test for it, but if you know there is a certain situation in that area, ask your agent or talk to me, then you have to be aware. You can test in advance if there is a Chinese drywall, but you have to know in order to test. Otherwise, you just buy it. Uh, by the way, which leads me to when you buy it not in your area, out of state, you always want to use uh, local people because you know you want to know what works in that area. Let me give you a very funny example. Salt Lake City, Mormons, big families, many kids. You buy a nice single family home, three, two, actually four, two and a half. Nobody's going to rent it. They're going for five, six, seven, eight bedrooms. Okay? Now, that what works in that marketplace. So if you don't know that, that's a problem, okay? So just be aware, there's always what works within that marketplace or with that, you know, within that area. Okay, a couple of uh, uh, um, suggestions I want to make. When you, when you put your deposit, remember the offer got accepted, 
Now we have to put the deposit, two, three, four, whatever thousand dollars we're putting in the deposit, make sure, or I suggest you put it in an escrow, you don't give it to the seller. Escrow, it's more protected. The seller, less protected. So just keep that in mind. Um, when you're analyzing the deal, make sure you know how much expenses you should be preparing yourself for after closing. Many times when you buy REO, foreclosure, there's gonna be some work need to be done on the property to make it the rent ready. Paint, carpets, touch-ups, appliances, and so on. It doesn't have to be much, but it's there. So if you're kind of saying, okay, I'm gonna pay 20,000 for the property, you know, $4,000 more for closing costs, and then that's it, that's what you pretty much have, what happens if you have now $4,000 in additional repairs? Okay, you have to be prepared for that. Sometimes the lender will finance that, so ask about that, but not always. So just be ready for that. You know, it's all about preparation as well. Um, helping the agent. The better you have clear goal what you're trying to accomplish, the more you know, the better you provide that information to your agent who works for you, who's now your team member, he's not your opponent, he's on your team, the better job he will do for you finding properties that's relevant for you. So keep that in mind, it's important. Uh, inspection appraisal, we talked about enough. Cashier check and wire, when you are closing the settlement day, you can't say, I think I said it, you can't say, you know, personal check, it has to be either a wire or cashier's check. And when you're signing the documents, especially the mortgage document, you're gonna need a notary to notarize those documents. Just be ready, okay? Notaries are easy to find, but you just have to, uh, uh, to be aware of that. Um, few things that I have kind of over the years refined with my own personal you know, portfolio and investments. I do suggest not spreading around over too many markets, diversifying and buying one in six markets, you know, one property per market in six markets. It's doable, but the reason it's gonna be a little bit difficult because every property management is different and there's a learning curve and they operate differently than the other property management. It's easier to consolidate it's better you know, for your time, you know, time management and energy management when you're dealing with one property management company or two. That's the only reason I'm suggesting it. So I don't think you should only focus on one market, but maybe one by you know, five, in, five to 10 in one market and five to 10 in another market or so on, not spreading around over too much markets if you can. Also, you get to know the area a little bit better. And if you travel to area, you can see multiple properties in one visit instead of you know, zip, zip, you know, zip zapping over the, you know, the, the country. Um, when, you, um, when you do Google Satellite, you know, Google Maps and Satellite, don't, you know, they're, remember, they're outdated, you know, they're dated. So the photo that you're seeing of the street of the house or whatever, that could be two years old, okay? I always tell the story that one of the properties I've bought and I've been to in Fort Worth, Texas, Two years after, when I go to Google Maps and I do the satellite, it still shows a construction site. I've been there, I know it's there, but it still shows. Just remember that. And one of the most important points you have to remember, very important, be proactive. And that goes everywhere. Meaning, you call an agent. The agent doesn't respond. You, you, you know, immediately investors say, this guy doesn't want to sell me. What? If you're not taking charge of your investment, nobody will. Those agents are salespeople. But those salespeople are also busy. And they miss, and they're, you know, they're also human, so things fall between the cracks. So if you don't take charge in the initiative, you will not be able to complete, complete the transaction. So if someone didn't respond back, so what? It's not about ego, it's about success, you know, success, being successful. Call again. Email again. You know, if they're really bad, maybe you should consider moving to the next guy. But if they only just got, you know, something happened and they say they'll call you and you know what? When the kid cries and when the kids are on the arm and when this happens and when that, that happens. Give yourself a break and give them a break and give them another shot. Okay, nothing's gonna happen. They all wanna do a good job and that goes for the property managers, and that goes for the lender, and that goes to every area of the, you know, I don't want to say in your life, but at least when it comes to investing, all the people around you are, should be the one who's selling to you, but if you're not proactive with them, I'm not sure you're gonna be successful, okay? You know what I mean? You have to be on the top of them all the time, but just be, remember, nobody answered or nobody called, 
Okay, give it another shot. You're waiting on an answer, took a little bit while, no big deal. Try again, nothing happened. Okay, so it's very, very, very important. I, I get a lot of frustration on that point. Change your mindset, be proactive, you'll do better. So just a little bit, if it's not clear, uh, what I do is I work with investors who are coming to me, I help them crystallize the goals and trying to see what works for them financially, experience and so on, and then I try to put them in the right directions and I have teams uh, in every market that I think are, are good to invest in. So it's a system in that market and there's a lot of support I provide. I'm not going to talk about much about myself, but I just wanted you guys to understand what I do in the process because I get that, asked that a lot. Um, and then there's a lot of support. Chris, you know, getting a clear vision what you want to accomplish, where you should be doing it, and then the, you know, the purchase process or the acquisition you know, process phase is not always smooth. Sometimes something happens and there's a question and someone told you something, so it's good to have some other person who helps you stay on track and to answer those questions and find those, you know, those answers. And then when you close on the property, and it does not get rented immediately, you know, or does not, or it takes a little bit longer. You know, someone is there to put some pressure and to put things in perspective and to help you overcome all those 20% issue. 20% of the time, there's you know some issues, and many of you are going to be meeting them or facing them for the first time. So you don't know if it's right or wrong or true or not, and you need someone that will look, at, you know, after your uh, interest. And that someone is someone like myself that knows, been, been there, you know, done that for a lot, you know, many times. And that's how, you know, I help my investors, not just to get started, but to move on and move on and, you know, provide that support. There's a lot of support, need, you know, needed in the process of investing. And it doesn't stop with one property. And like I said, I have teams in Atlanta, Dallas, and Orlando. In, you know, in Atlanta, in all three, we're doing rentals. In Atlanta and Dallas, we're doing flips. In Atlanta, we also have a turnkey. Turnkey meaning they're already rehabbed and renter inside. Um, that means we have agents, property managers, and rehab teams in almost all of the markets. Actually, in Orlando, we don't do re uh, flips and rehab. Um, so we don't, I should probably take that off. Hey, Danny? Yes. What prevents the flips in Orlando? Margin. There's not enough margin to buy, fix up, and flip. I'm not saying it's impossible. But it's just not as much as we, you know, we have margins, enough margins to buy it low, to sell it relatively high in, in Atlanta and Dallas, which we just don't have in, in Orlando. We are searching for that, but that's, a, that's the main reason. And here's my contact details. And we're going to take questions, unless you want me to cover some of the things that I